Welcome back. This is it. The future is here. We're going to start talking about Internet Europe in 2021-2027 period. You got a quick glimpse of the future topics just before we started and uh, we're going to dive deeper right now. I am here with Nicolas Sanger, our head of uh, projects and platforms unit, and he's going to take you through everything. Well, not everything, but a lot of things you need to know about the future program. We will go through quite a lot of information today. Don't worry, the session will be recorded, you'll have access to it later, you'll get all the materials. And we want to make it interactive, so as we've been saying, you can post your questions in the Q&A. We will keep picking them up as we, as we go through the program. We have quite a bit of time reserved for questions and answers, and we are planning to keep this session going until 12. If there are a lot of questions, if we cannot cover them all during this session, we are also prepared to continue a little bit after 12 as well. So don't worry, you'll get questions, you'll get answers, and we'll give you information and get you ready for the future. And that being said, we already saw that you want to know about priorities, timing, topics, how things are going to work. Should we dive right in? Yeah, with pleasure. All right, let's get going. Can we have a quick look at the Slido poll again? Because people indeed have been asking for quite a few things and there are a lot of topics to cover. Somebody was asking, was interested in absolutely everything. We might not be able to cover that. Time might be a little bit short, short for that as well. And also um, there is a little bit of word of a warning here because we are indeed still preparing how things are going to work. And Nico, before we start, what should people keep in mind? Yes, uh, I think we have to start with uh, a, a warning before going into the, all the details of this new program. We are in a transition period currently. Mm -hmm. uh, as you said, all the details are still not completely sorted out. So you have uh, to be aware that um, the program itself is not approved yet by the Commission. And of course, the monitoring committee of the future program does not exist yet. So all the features we're going to present now have to be taken a bit with care uh, because they still need to be approved by the Commission and validated by the monitoring committee. But let's say that it's very likely that uh, most of these features, all these features should be more or less confirmed early next year. And the most important, I think, for me is that it should not prevent you uh, from preparing already uh, good applications for the future program. Exactly. So take note of the information and uh, start getting ready. Let's start. Nico, first things first, in a nutshell, new program. What is new? What are the features? What can you say about the features of the new Interreg Europe program? Let's start with some basics. Yes, so what I would propose is maybe to start with uh, the program as a whole, the, the, the very general feature. And I would repeat certain things that you've heard during these two days, but uh, well, I think it's, uh, it's still important. Uh, so I'll start with uh, the overall program objective. From, um, from this objective, you see that there's no real uh, change for those of you who know the current program. Uh, we, the program keep this ambitious and strategic objective of improving regional development policies. So it's a, it's a nice program, it's an ambitious program. And you have also to see that the, the, the approach to regional development policy is very open. Uh, we include in this policies developed at local level by municipalities, by cities, or at a more uh, broader level, the district, the counties, the regions, of course, and even in some countries uh, at the national level. Mm. Uh, regional development policies can also be developed at the national level. So it's a very broad approach uh, to regional development policies. But also, um, we keep a certain focus on what we call the structural fund programs, the mainstream programs. So this program should still uh, help uh, for better implementation of the operational program prepared in the partner states and in the different regions. That's what I can say for the overall objective, no revolution there. 
If we go uh, now to the geographical coverage and the eligible area, Erwin has already mentioned it. Uh, unfortunately, our UK colleagues will no longer be uh, eligible uh, due to Brexit, but we remain the only interreg Europe, uh, the only interreg program, sorry, to be pan-European. So all uh, 27 uh, member states will be eligible, and we have also two associated countries, uh, Norway and Switzerland. This is very attractive, I think, for the regions because it allows the regions to really broaden their horizon, to work with uh, regions from di very different contexts, and we really consider this as a, as a source of richness for the cooperation. We will come back later, mm. I think, to, to this, Mia. But that's what uh, we can say for the uh, eligible area. Uh, a third element also that do not uh, fundamentally change is the way we are supposed to uh, achieve the objective. Uh, we, are, we remain a capacity building program. Uh, for those who know, we are part of what we call the strength C of European Territorial Cooperation, together with our BACT, ESPON, and Interact. And these are programs dedicated to capacity building. So uh, Interreg Europe is all about uh, identifying, analyzing, disseminating, and hopefully transferring uh, good practices from region to region. There's no real change also in this regard. The only thing I want to highlight there is that uh, the rationale I've just described has two uh, important consequence, consequences. The first one is that we are targeting mainly uh, policymakers, meaning the authorities that are responsible for the, the policies. And the second element is we are an exchange of experience program. We are not an investment program. We are not a research program. There's a lot of other EU programs uh, for that. We are really there to help regions to network uh, together. And these two elements makes us very different uh, also from other interreg programs, uh, the cross-border and the transnational program. I'd like to go to the fourth element now on the, on the program. And I see a lot of interest uh, already this morning on the topics. There, there is a change. The, third, the three first elements, I don't think we can say there's fundamental change, but for the scope of the program, we can really say that there's an evolution, and this evolution, we think it's very uh, b positive for the beneficiary because it opens up the opportunities for them. The member states, uh, you, you've heard about the four priorities yesterday. We are really on four thematic priorities. The member state decided to give up this approach and to select only one cross-cutting priority on capacity building. And this means that the program will be able to cover almost any topics of regional development, uh, as long as uh, it is relevant for the cohesion policy. And on the slide, you see these six icons that were presented. Uh, this uh, gather all the topics that we could cover in the future. Um, so the two first ones, uh, greener and smarter, are more or less what we are already doing in our program. You know well these subjects. But we are opening up the program to a lot of new topics. Uh, I would mention, for instance, employment, social inclusion, uh, risk management, uh, transport through the uh, more connected Europe also. And maybe it's interesting also for you to know the, the last uh, icon, which is called governance. We could also support uh, cooperation on subjects that are not necessarily thematic. Uh, we could really focus on the way you implement uh, a public intervention, uh, a regional development policies. It may be related, for instance, to the way the public authority uh, deal with procurement rules or state aids or the way they evaluate uh, their policies. All this would also be possible in the future to have more process governance related subjects for the cooperation. So I wanted to spend a bit of time on this because it seems uh, to be of high interest uh, to the people. But the very good news, what you have to uh, keep in mind, we open up really to a lot of uh, topics and uh, subjects. The last thing I wanted to say uh, on this uh, cooperation scope is that the partner states still decided uh, to go for a concentration principle, to be in line also with uh, the regulation, uh, the cohesion policy philosophy. And this, uh, this concentration was decided according to the highest EU priorities, let's say, but also to what the member states consider as high priority for the regions. What does it mean? It means that uh, the member states would like 80% of the budget to be spent on a certain number of subjects. And these subjects are covered in the smarter and greener Europe, full topics there, and partly under also a more social Europe. 
especially in relation to the crisis we are going through. Uh, subjects like employment, uh, like uh, cultural uh, tourism, or also else will also be part of this 80% concentration. All right. I think there's a lot of very good information there for people to understand. So many of the key features remain, if not the same, very similar as before. So anyone who's already been working with Interreg Europe or who knows our program, it's, it's more of an evolution than a drastic change. But indeed, the topic aspect is something new. We have been very much talking about the four topics of the current program. You, you saw those yesterday as we were talking about it in the thematic sessions and, and you'll see more examples in the expo. But now there is indeed even more choice, even though we do expect to see a lot of smart and green as we get going with the program. Um, going into how this is going to work, we've talked about the program. How does this work for the projects? Nico, can we start going into the project aspect a bit more? Yes, of course, with pleasure. I think it's uh, what is of main interest anyway for the participants of today. So after uh, the general program features, I'd like to go uh, to a bit more in details into the, the projects. And following a bit uh, the, the logic we had for the program, let's start with the project objective. Um, in a way, uh, this program is a bit top down because the project's uh, objectives are predefined by the program. Uh, when you develop a project in Interreg Europe, you need to identify a certain number of policies you'd like to improve in the different regions. And the objective of the project is very simple, is to try to improve uh, these policies that you have selected at the beginning of the project. Um, so this will apply to all projects we're going to finance. And here, uh, there's also no real change compared to the, to the current approach. One of the things I mentioned earlier is that we are still focusing on uh, the implementation of the structural fund programs, uh, the, the programs that are prepared by the member states or the regions. Um, and uh, there, there is a, a, an evolution which is, we think, positive also for the beneficiary because the rules become more flexible for the future project. What's going to happen in the future program is that in each project, you should demonstrate that at least one of these policy is what we call an investment for jobs and goals goal program. Uh, so meaning an operational program, either at national or regional level. And all the rest, it's open. You can uh, really address uh, policies at local, regional or national level. And this is rather good news because it introduces more flexibility uh, for the beneficiaries. Just as a reminder, in the current program, it was half 50% of the policy address that had to be uh, structural fund programs. So here the member states also, because the regulation has evolved in its wording, the member states wanted to uh, be a bit more flexible in the policy we have to improve or the program has to improve. All right. I think that gives a good overview of the, um, of the objectives, but how does this work? How do the project then work towards meeting these objectives? What are the activities? Of course, of course. And again, following this logic, how do you achieve this objective? Uh, here again, I, I simply quote the regulation uh, on the slide, as you see. Uh, the, 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 the regulation referred to us on exchange of experience, innovative approach and capacity building. And more or less, uh, this is what we are doing already now. We are there for uh, visiting each other, for understanding each other, for doing peer reviews, workshops, seminars, so we can really have access to the experience and practices uh, of the different regions in Europe and exploit this knowledge so I found inspiration and new solutions to my regions. More or less, no real uh, changes. However, there is this wording which is a bit new uh, called innovative approaches. And uh, discussing also with the partner states and even with our projects currently, uh, we, in the future, we would open up a bit more what we call the learning by doing, learning by testing, learning by experimenting. And uh, what it means concretely is that there will be more room for pilot actions. Uh, in the current program, it was uh, very strict. You could only uh, start them uh, in the second uh, phase of the project. In the future, it will be possible for the projects to propose pilot actions uh, from the start of their projects. Uh, so this is, again, uh, a flexibility that we think is, is a good news uh, for the beneficiaries. They will have more freedom uh, to propose these kind of activities and to learn from, uh, from, from doing, simply. 
Yes, so some more flexibility, but I think this also again addresses probably quite a few questions that might, must be coming from the participants in terms of what type of activities and what kind of actions and so on. Um, can we get even a bit more concrete? How does this work in practice? Uh, how does the implementation go? What's a normal Interreg Europe project, let's say? Yes, we, we have to do so because we are on the activities, but how are these activities organized? And I see also some of the questions uh, at the beginning uh, of this morning, so hopefully we will answer uh, also these kind of questions. Uh, we, um, each project in the future we will, will have to be implemented in two steps, let's say, in two phases. And here you may say, ah, okay, so this is uh, exactly what we are uh, currently doing. Uh, more, more or less, again, we will use a lot more or less this morning, um, not completely, because uh, of course these uh, phases have a new name now. Uh, we mentioned the core phases and the follow-up phases, but uh, I would insist on two elements. First, uh, they are fixed in duration, uh, at least for the core phase this is new, uh, to uh, make the rules more straightforward, the requirements more straightforward, both for the program but also for the beneficiaries. We fix three years uh, for learning from each other, from exchanging the good practices and transferring the good practices and hopefully achieving uh, the results. And the second uh, phase is more or less the same than now. It's really to monitor what is the impact, what are the effects uh, of this policy improvement that you have achieved uh, in the first year. So overall, you will have a project organized in four years through two different uh, phases. I'd like to say a few more about the, the, the evolution and I think the additional flexibility for the project is that in the current period, a lot of our project told us it's very difficult, this rigidity between phase one and phase two, also financially, uh, we would really like this to evolve. Uh, so we try to follow up uh, on these uh, lessons learned from the current period. We also discuss with our partner states and an, a second change is that there will be much more flexibility between these two phases. Still, they have uh, their own rationale and their own objective. But uh, I, I would mention two things. The first one is that it's up to the project, to each project, to design and define the way they see the follow-up phase, which is completely different from the current program, where we were predefining the program, we're predefining even the activity there. So much more open uh, for the project uh, to define the, the follow-up phase. And the second element, which was also uh, requested by the, the partners, the current partners, it's to continue the learning uh, in the second phase. You can also uh, learn a lot from uh, the impact of the policy uh, changes, uh, the results of the project. So we continue, if it's possible for the project at least to continue the learning in the second phase. Last thing I wanted to mention, there is a kind of revolution there for uh, the action plan. Uh, for those who know the current program, the action plan was the most important deliverable at the end of the core phase. We are reviewing this approach because the new approach is that the core phase is at the heart of Interreg Europe. That's where you do the learning, the exchange of experience, and hopefully you should achieve your objective at the end of this core phase. You should have uh, reached a policy improvement uh, in the different regions. However, policy making is difficult. It can be sometimes challenging uh, to achieve this objective in three years. Only the regions that do not demonstrate policy improvement at the end of the core phase will be required to produce an action plan. So it's, it's a very different uh, from the current program. The action plan becomes uh, a deliverable per default uh, for different reasons. I could not make any improvement in my region. So I produce a light document where I list one, two, three actions where I will try in the last year of the program, of the project, sorry, uh, to really do something in my regions with uh, the learning I got from the projects. So this is also, I think, quite interesting to mention that uh, it becomes quite different uh, when in terms of action plan in the new uh, program. So some novelties there as well. And I told you there was going to be a lot of information. I hope you're still keeping up with all of this. We are going to cover one more 
important aspect with Nico and then we'll start taking some of your questions. So if you have any, now would be a good time to pop that in the Q&A tab. And I do want to repeat that, you know, you keep your general comments in the chat. Very nice to hear how, how you feel about the program, what you're interested in, how things are looking from your perspective. But questions in the Q&A tab because it makes it a lot easier for our chat team to pick them up and see which ones they either answer directly and which ones we pick up here to discuss with you. But okay, we've covered how the program works roughly. We've talked about the projects and how they will be implemented, how things are going to work on that side. Time to drill a little bit deeper and talk about who's going to be in those projects. Let's talk about partners, Nico. Um, starting with something very, very basic. Interreg Europe projects, who can be a partner? What are the eligibility criteria, let's say? Yes, uh, the, the, the partnership is a, is a core feature in Interreg Europe, like in any, uh, I think, uh, Interreg programs, but particularly in Interreg Europe, and I'll try to explain you why. But uh, let's start with your very basic question, Mia, who is eligible? Uh, this, uh, the rules are exactly the same, are identical to the current program. Um, we have three status uh, that are eligible, uh, legal status that are eligible uh, for an organization to get funding from Interreg Europe. We have what we call the public authorities, and this can be uh, local, regional, national authorities, whatever uh, the level. We have the notion of bodies governed by public law, and here you often find uh, what we call the intermediary organization, uh, environment agency, agencies, business support organizations, uh, these kind of uh, organizations that are also quite important for uh, policy making. And we uh, keep uh, the last status, which is called private uh, non-profit bodies, uh, which is also a, a, an important uh, 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 status. Here, it really depends on the country, but it can, for instance, be the case of uh, chambers of commerce in certain countries or cluster organizations or uh, interest group organizations that can qualify as private uh, non-profit bodies. But... What I'd like to make clear uh, on, this, uh, on this subject, because I saw some of the questions yesterday, uh, Interreg Europe has not changed since the last 20 years. We are not, uh, it's not possible to finance directly the private for-profit organization. We cannot directly uh, finance SMEs or companies. We would keep uh, what we call the stakeholder group in each of the region. Uh, and uh, if relevant, this kind of private organization, SMEs or, or, or private companies in general, could be involved in the project through the stakeholder group, but they would not be eligible for funding. They would not receive uh, ERDF directly. All right, that covers a very kind of important ground rules there. Um, how about geographic coverage? This is another important element uh, in our program, uh, the, the geographical coverage. And if I may, I'd like to come back uh, a bit on what we learn in this programming period. Uh, and this is also uh, what we learned from previous programming periods. Uh, there's a few statistics on this slide. Uh, you see on the table um, a division of Europe in four areas. This is completely artificial, but we did this division uh, to uh, try to cover the whole Europe and to uh, express what we mean by a broad geographical coverage. And if you look at this area, and if you look at the 258 projects that are currently approved, you realize that uh, a vast majority, uh, uh, majority of them, around two-thirds, are covering four of these areas that are defined. So it really shows that the running projects uh, are really going beyond cross-border and cross-national cooperation area. They really try to uh, exchange experience among very different regions from different corners of Europe. And just to be clear, what I mean by covering this area, it means that you simply have one partner from this area. You don't need to have uh, several, but uh, it's enough to have one. And uh, another word I would like to say, there's only 2% of the current project that cover two areas only. And when you investigate, when you look at them, you understand why. Uh, out of these uh, three projects, two are gathering only, or mainly, I would say, outermost regions. So this is understandable that outermost regions have very particular challenges to face, and that's the reason why, of course, uh, this rule do not completely apply to this, to, to them. And uh, the third case was a kind of exceptional case. It covers only two areas, but the partnership is constituted only 
of policy responsible authorities, really the core target group of the program, and that's the reason why uh, this quality compensates, in a way, uh, the rather weak uh, geographical coverage. But you understand that uh, Interreg Europe attached a lot of importance to this geographical coverage. And this leads me to the next programming period, the, the, the future program. Um, it is uh, almost certain now that there will be uh, an eligibility rule when it comes to the geographical coverage to ensure uh, that the partnership is broad enough. Mm. We have to uh, still decide about the details with the partner states, but uh, it will be either four of the area you've seen on the slide before, or three that needs to be covered in each partnership. So, in other words, it's an encouragement for you to really look uh, beyond your traditional cooperation area and to really ensure a broad coverage of your partnership. All right, good. That's a very, very good overview there. Uh, one more aspect and then it's time for Q&A. Um, still staying with the partnerships, let's talk a little bit more about what type of what, what kind of nature of partnerships we have in the project. So let's, let's just spend a minute on the partnerships and clarify that before we start taking questions. Yes, of course. Um, this is uh, my, my last uh, important point on my side. It's about the nature of the partners to be involved. And again there, I'd like to, uh, like for the geographical coverage, to give you a bit of insight of what we learned, but again from the past 20 years of uh, inter-regional cooperation. Um, I've mentioned who is eligible on one side. That's a pure uh, status element, that's a pure legal element. Uh, it does not uh, mean that uh, all these bodies uh, have to come all the time. Because of the rationale of the program and what I explained at the beginning, this focus on the policy, the core target group of the program remains uh, the authorities that are in charge uh, of uh, the policies, let's be clear. And this was also reflected uh, in the 2014-2020 period. If you look, for instance, uh, at the success rate of the, uh, of the application and the reason why they were not uh, approved at the end, you realize that one of the main source of failure of the applications in the 2014-2020 period was due to the lack of the policy relevance of the partnership. We received a lot of applications from organizations that were not able to explain their links with the policy making and their capacity to improve uh, the policies. And even for the approved projects, because we still have a lot of projects where the policy makers are not always directly uh, involved, the, the very valuable results that Erwin presented earlier, you, 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 when you dig into them, you realize that 60% um, of these uh, results can be indirectly, unfortunately, attributed to the program because it's an intermediary organization that convinces a policymaker, which is not, who is not in the partnership, uh, to, to do things, to, to finance a new project. So it's still a result from our program, but it's a bit indirect because we were supporting this intermediary organization and not the policymakers. So there was a clear conclusion from the program evaluation of the previous program. Uh, this is uh, mentioned on the slide. The evaluation recommend us uh, to make the participation of the policymakers, of the the organization, the authorities in charge of the uh, regional development policies obligatory in the future. And now we can come to the proposal uh, on the table for the future program. We have discussed uh, uh, extensively with our partner states this rule. Uh, it is very likely that in the future, uh, the involvement of the policy responsible authority as partners will be obligatory for at least half of the policies addressed in the project. I hope this is clear for everybody, it's a bit technical, but a project where eight regions are involved, they would like to uh, improve eight different uh, policies. For at least four regions, the, the authority in charge of this policy has to be a partner. And for the remaining, when it's not possible for different reasons, when it's not possible for the, the other policy instruments, then this authority will have to come as what we call now associated policy authority. It's a new status uh, that uh, we create for the new program. And very briefly, I'll tell you what it means uh, to be uh, uh, an associated policy authority. It means first that you will appear uh, in the application form, officially. So uh, it's, it's a kind of golden stakeholder status. Uh, you will have some details. You won't have any budget, so it should still be easy for uh, the public authority uh, to, to be involved or the, the authority concerned. 
uh, but your travel and accommodation costs could be paid by the partners that uh, represent the region. You will need to provide a declaration which uh, replaces what we used to call uh, currently the letter of support. And important element, it's a, it's a real change, we, the program will check regularly whether or not this uh, associated policy authority is really involved in the cooperation. Through the progress report, there will be a dedicated section. So we will really try to monitor whether this happens because at the end of the day, uh, this is key uh, for the success uh, of the project and for achieving policy improvement. That's what we can, we can say at this stage on the, on the partnership requirements. Yes, thank you, Nico, so much for this overview. I hope this has given you a lot of information. You asked to know more about the program. Here it comes. Now it is time to turn back to you and get a, a little bit of a feeling of how it sounds so far. Are, are you still keeping up with this? Do you have some questions? We would also like to know that now that we're moving to the new program and we'll be working with six new different topics from the ones that we've had in this program, uh, which ones of those are of interest to you? We have project ideas for this event submitted under every single one of those six new topics, so there are already a lot of ideas, but which ones are of interest to you? Give some input in our poll, we will have one running in the Slido tab, so have a look at that. And I want to turn to Petra and get a little bit of a feeling of how things are looking on the chat side. Petra, how is it? It's very busy, I have to say. People have plenty, plenty of questions. I think that Nico's presentation already covered a number of them, but maybe let's just run through them. Many of them could be just yes and no. So Nico, if I may, uh, I group, try to group them a little bit by the topics. So uh, about partnership, uh, a number of people are asking about the kinds of institutions that are eligible. So Maria would like a confirmation public port authorities are eligible? Nico, quickly. <laughs> uh, very good question. Uh, I, I think we could say yes, they will certainly be eligible uh, because you, uh, you use the word public port authority. So I'm almost sure they would qualify uh, to the eligibility. At the end of the day, uh, it will be your uh, national point of contact that could also confirm this because the member states will be responsible uh, for confirming the status uh, of the partners. But I can already ensure that this kind of organization are uh, indeed eligible. Okay, uh, I'll try to group them uh, so that maybe it's faster. Uh, Anna's asking about suitability for cities. Antonietta would like to know whether universities can present a project. Then we have a question uh, whether for-profit companies can participate. And Monica has a question about institutions gathering regions. So I would assume associations of regions. So, Nico, cities, universities, for-profit companies or associations of regions, where the eligibility would be? Okay, I'll try to make it uh, quick. Cities, yes. Um, as I said earlier, uh, private, uh, universities, sorry, uh, certainly yes. Now, be careful because universities are important for the policy ecosystem, but usually they are not directly responsible for the policy, so they would need to come uh, with the authority in charge uh, of the policy. Um, private for-profit, I say very clearly, they, won't, they cannot have access to funding. They are ineligible, uh, not eligible in Interreg Europe. Association of U U regions are usually considered as body governed by public law, so most of the time they are also eligible. Another set of questions related to partnership uh, relates to the geographical uh, question. You already mentioned Norway can participate, so I think this could be covered. But we had few questions about the UK. Are they completely out uh, um, or uh, as non-EU entity, and Sylvia is asking about it, whether a non-EU entity can be a partner in a project? So I suppose EU would count there too. So what would be the answer to this? Yes, it's, it's a very good question because we, we call them in our world jargon third country partner and uh, UK organizations or any organization outside the EU are uh, very welcome to join uh, projects. The only uh, issue for them is that they will not be eligible to ERDF funding, so they will need to find their own funding sources to come to the projects. Otherwise, uh, of course, they can uh, participate. 
and I have another question that is still related to partnership. Jorge is asking, as a managing authority, what do you think is most important? Make new partnerships between regions or solidify cooperation between regions from the period 14-2020? How would you uh, advise Jorge on uh, his project idea and cooperation? Uh, th this is another uh, crucial question. Uh, I was myself participating in a final conference last week of one of our approved projects and almost all the partners came to me telling me, uh, Nico, can we continue in this new uh, programming period? I would be very, very cautious with this uh, because we are not there to uh, finance uh, continue existing partnership. We have this uh, notion of innovative character of the proposal. So if I would have had to say yes or no, I would say yes, go for new partner, try to find to renew uh, your, your cooperation, because if you come exactly with the same partners and with similar topic, uh, there's a chance that you would not demonstrate the innovative character of the proposal. All right, Petra, let's take one more question if you have something related to partners, but after that we'll take a little break from the questions because it sounds like our chat team also needs a little bit of time to digest all the questions coming in, so we'll let them sort those out, we'll continue with the questions, don't worry. Just want to repeat that the session is being recorded, you'll have access to all the material afterwards, including the Q&As, and we do have a reserve to keep answering your questions also after 12, so keep sending them, we'll keep answering them, we'll get through it together. Um, so, last question from the chat and then we continue. So last question, I will focus now more on some questions that were related to topics. By the way, you posted plenty of questions related to timing, related to funding, we'll cover them a bit later. But now about topics, uh, something that Nico already discussed, we have Richard who would like a clarification whether this 80% concentration principle that you talked about, Nico, is for the program or for a project. And the second one for clarification, whether a um, project needs to focus just on one topic or can't address more of them. So concentration principle and the topics. Yes, thanks a lot, Petra. These two uh, questions are interrelated in a way. The 80% concentration applies at program level. It's uh, the amount of uh, funding at program level that needs to be allocated to certain priorities. And this means also that you will see uh, in the future program manual, the uh, recommendations are the same. Please be, be, please be focused, be specific. Uh, a project needs to address a very specific issue. You cannot tackle everything at the same time. So uh, the 80% the of course do not apply at project level. Okay, thank you very much, Nico, for the answers. Thank you, Petra, for keeping up with the chat and, and thank you for the team behind the scenes working hard to, to keep those questions on order. Um, let's have a quick look at, at Slido because we've been asking you for your interest in the new topics and indeed you do have to make some choices, so it's important to understand where we are. Um, I do see a very good-looking chart at the moment on the screen, green and smart on the top of the list, which is very much in line with what we want to see, right, Nico? Yeah, it's very interesting, this uh, statistics, because it's what we were expecting, but we are not sure. And uh, we are not too worried about the 80% uh, concentration that we've just discussed, because according to the 20 years of experience, we know that this is under the subjects that most of the applications come, and this seems to be confirmed by, uh, by these statistics. Excellent. Very good. All right, it is time to continue. I heard that there were some questions about finances, so let's bring in a person who can answer those. I want, again, to give the floor to my colleagues to tell you a little bit more about Intrig Europe and how the program works. Right after these inputs from our colleagues, we will be here with Petra Geithner, who will tell us more about program finances and how it's going to work in the future. So, let's get ready for some more. Many policymakers in Europe are looking for efficient and innovative solutions for their challenges and Interreg Europe is an excellent tool to help them to find those solutions. For instance, they can find inspiration in the Good Practice database where we have thousands of validated good practices. We can help you find relevant policy solutions and you can find them quickly. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. It's about the policy learning platform, a fantastic tool to meet new people and to find solutions for your regions. Our team, the experts of the policy learning platform, they are ready to answer your questions and to connect you to the right people. Indeed, with like-minded peers, practitioners from all across Europe, they can come to your region, organize peer reviews 
directly addressing your interests, your needs for better policies on the ground. So, let's start diving into finances. Miko is still here with us in the studio, but Petra Geithner, our head of unit for, for finances and audit, have, has also joined us. So, let's start talking about how things are going to work in terms of budgets and money. Uh, Petra, welcome, first of all. Thank you. And yeah. then, first question. First things first. Irvin talked about this a little bit in the morning, but can you... Take us through how the budget is going to look for the future. Let's start with the big figures first. <laughs> yes. And uh, on this point, I'm very happy to be able to say that our budget increased in this programming period. And this, of course, also means that not only the program budget increased, but also the project budget um, um, increased. So while in the past we had 322 million euro from the ERDF available, now we will have 334 million euro available. I think this is very good news yes. for the projects. And what does it mean for the projects? What kind of budgets are the projects yeah. looking to get? <laughs> Moving from this big figure to what it means for an individual project. We expect that the project budgets will be um, financed between 1 million to 2 million euro from the ERDF. Of course, I think Nico mentioned already the requirements regarding the partnership. He mentioned already that pilot actions will be um, possible right from the beginning. So we assume also that the project budgets will um, increase. So we assume that they will be in this range between 1 and 2 million euro, more between 1.5, 2 million euro. All right, that's good. So setting some ground rules there. Uh, we did get some finance questions, Petra, so we'll go into those very quickly. But I'm going to take one that always comes up. Um, how does it work in terms of co-financing? So we know the budget, we know what kind of budget the projects will have. Um, in co-financing terms, what does it mean? Yeah, I think yeah, you realized that I was constantly using the word co-financing, ERDF, uh, the contribution from the ERDF. The program does not finance the project at 100%. However, I think the co-financing rate is very good because we really will make use of the maximum that the regulation allows, meaning that the public um, bodies will get 80% from the ERDF. It means they will have to contribute with 20% still. And for the non-private um, bodies, uh, um, non-profit private bodies, that's the correct term, um, they will um, still get 70% um, co-financing from the ERDF. It means those bodies would have to contribute with 30% from their own funding. And in many partner states and regions also there is funding available um, on, from the national level um, that they also, in addition to the funding from the European Union, they also contribute sometimes. Yes, I think this table that we have on the screen is very useful for people to get an overview of how things will work. Um, going from the, the budgets and the co-financing a little bit into the practical side of the project work and how things are going to work. Um, how about the costs and different categories? What kind of costs are eligible and what is covered in the, in the project as, as part of it? Um, I think for those um, that um, have been involved in Interreg Europe already in the past, they will notice that there, is, there are not so many changes. Um, there is a new budget line, but I'll explain this in a moment. But nevertheless, I assume among the participants are also a few newcomers, so maybe I can a little bit take them through what budget lines we have. So first of all, it might be interesting to know that um, we also finance the preparation of the projects. However, here I have to say that um, the preparation is financed only for those projects that are successful in the end. And then in terms of activities, um, this is of course then also reflected in the budget as the projects are about learning, about exchange of experience. It's of course most important that we have um, the staff involved. So the bulk of the budget um, will go, I think, to the staff cost uh, category. Um, then, of course, we also finance some office overheads and the travel and accommodation budget line is also an important one. We hope that projects soon can freely meet again, have study visits, um, exchange in person, and for this also a travel budget is um, required. Then there is also an external expertise budget because when you meet, you also have venues, you have to pay catering, um, things like this. Some also require some external project um, um, help, uh, help managing the project, and that would be covered by this budget line. 
And for a classical project without um, pilots um, we, um, under the equipment budget line, we would only see small amounts of small budget for office equipment. However, um, for those that will have pilots, this budget line might be a bit more interesting because when you have a pilot, you might also need some more important um, equipment. And now, talking of pilots, that's also where I come to this new budget line that um, is, um, appears now. It's the infrastructure and works budget line. However, here I have to be very careful because it sounds enormous. Interreg Europe is and won't be an investment program. So this budget line is only reserved, first of all, for the pilots. And in addition, um, it will play a very minor role. It's just we realized that sometimes in a pilot um, you need some equipment, but it's not the purchase of the equipment itself that needs to be financed, but also the installation of equipment. And this small building material, some labor for the installation, belongs to this new budget line. So it's just complementary things that will be financed here in relation to an equipment. Excellent. Thank you, Petra. I think that gives a very good overview of, of how things will work uh, for those who might be new to the program, but also for those who might be familiar with the program. So there are indeed some, some new elements in the mix as well, which is nice to see. Um, let's go a bit more into how this works in practice, shall we? Um, so. We heard already when Nico was talking about the program that we have taken stock of how things have been working and learning also from our experience and making some changes based on that. How, how are things on the on the reporting side and, and cost and finance management side? How are we doing there? Well, there is also fortunately some evolution. When I started in Interreg uh, 20 years ago, um, you still had to keep every little invoice, even the electricity bill of your organization, you had to divide it down and make uh, pro rata calculations to just claim, I don't know, 10 euro electricity for the staff member working on the project. Um, I think here some fundamental improvements have been made. So we are using now much more flat rates and lump sums for which no concrete proofs are um, needed and um, where then um, we know that these costs exist so that's where we have then defined certain percentages with um, which we will use um, for cliff or which we will use so that projects can claim these costs in a very simple way so i mentioned the preparation cost for this there is a lump sum of 17,500 euro um, foreseen and for covering the office uh, costs we will put it in relation to the staff costs of um, you claim your real staff costs, and on top of it, you will get 15% um, to cover your um, office overhead costs. And now that's the new thing, the new flat rate, since the experience with the office flat rate was so positive, um, the partner states um, have preliminarily decided to also introduce the flat rate for the travel budget line. Uh, so it means on top of staff costs, um, you will also get 15% to cover your travel costs. So that will be, I think, a fundamental um, simplification because this is then the end of keeping all little metro tickets and all these things and showing it to your controller. So um, we hope that this will also make exchanging and cooperating simpler. Well, I don't know who would not welcome more simplification, so I think that's definitely good news. Um, we have now added a bit more information on top of the program, project and partnership details. You now know a little bit about the finances as well. I'm sure you still have some questions. So use the Q&A tab to send those in. I will turn back to Petra because first of all, I'm curious to see how the Slido is looking. Do we still have a smart and green or green and smart on the top of the list? Uh, what are people interested in? And second of all, um, do we have some questions for Petra? Well, we have plenty of questions, I have to say. I think that we are overwhelmed, but luckily we have many people answering them in typing. I'll, we'll try to um, take the questions as many as we can live and ask Petra and Nico to react uh, and uh, answer them. But first, as uh, Mia asked uh, about uh, the results of our Slido poll, uh, close to 200 people already voted and clearly uh, the two winners are still a green topic, which we are very happy about. And over 50% of you also are very interested in smart topic. Again, the two where the concentration of our funds should go. So this is, I think, a very 
very good news. The third uh, is social, again going to exactly uh, along the lines uh, that we want. So uh, I think that just confirms uh, where the interest is and we are very happy to see it. Excellent. So let's take some questions then, because the, the list is looking good and I'm sure that people can also use this information when they are looking for partners later on today. But, but what? Um, do we have some questions on finances for Petra? Let's start with those and let's continue with the rest later, because indeed Petra and Nico will both stay here with us. So don't worry, we'll cover the questions. <laughs> Yeah, a number of the questions, I think they are just repeating what you've just said, Petra. So maybe I'll pick those that go more into clarification uh, uh, yeah, uh, of, of where these funds go. So uh, one of the questions is, will there be funding for the follow-up phase? Sonia is asking, and then Jessica go, goes even more deeper and is asking more specifically whether if there is funding, it will be in a lump sum or real costs. So Petra, if you can answer that. Um, yes, I assume this participant knows more already about how Interreg Europe in the past worked and especially our fourth call project. Um, in the future, um, I confirm that the follow-up phase will continue to be financed from the program. And in addition, I can say that uh, we will move back um, for this or to the real cost um, uh, way of financing things. Because first of all, we have simplified so much all the other budget lines. And in addition, we think now that the follow-up phase is a bit more flexible, it's much more difficult to standardize and um, to grant a lump sum for this. So that's why um, the whole project is financed, including the follow-up phase, and this on a real cost basis, with, of course, the simplifications that I mentioned on the various budget lines. Um, Valeria? Uh, Valeria is then asking about some clarification about this fixed percentage applied to salary costs. What does it mean? <laughs> but we already go in very, very kind of detail, but maybe if you can clarify for, for Valeria. Thank you, Valeria, for this question. Um, uh, yeah, for the staff costs, the idea is to still base um, the reporting on the real staff costs. In a staff-intensive program like Interreg Europe, we found it important to still to do justice to the staff costs of the staff members involved and to reimburse the actual costs. Um, however, um, the big simplification um, is that we will just use one single method to not, so that there is no confusion how to calculate it and um, that project partners will be able to fix a percentage um, at the beginning of the project to estimate, to assume how much they will be involved in the project. And then at the time of reporting, they just um, apply this percentage to the actual staff cost and report it. So no more timesheets, no more nitty gritty details. It's a, an assignment letter, you put a percentage and then you would apply it to your actual staff costs. And that way we think it's a good compromise between simplification, but at the same time still reflecting um, the actual um, salary costs of the staff members involved, because we want to have different range of staff members involved in our projects. So I think that our uh, listeners, our participants uh, are very happy to hear about simplifications. Uh, we have another question uh, clarifying kind of how the budget works. Uh, we have a question. So, if a partner is not a policy authority, I assume the policy responsible authority, he cannot have a budget in the project? So that's the question. Is it correct that unless there is a policy responsible authority, uh, they don't have budget? Is that correct? <laughs> well, <clears throat> any partner who is an actual partner in the project will also have a budget. However, um, Nico mentioned, I think, already the associated policy authorities. So they are not a formal partner. They are just associated to the project and they will not come with a budget of their own. However, it will be possible for the um, partners that this policy authority is associated to, um, to take on board some um, travel costs for this um, authority. Um, so that this authority is also able to join the study visits to participate in exchange of experience meetings. But I can confirm, yes, to have a budget, to get directly funding from the program, you have to be a partner. 
Uh, and then maybe I would just group a few questions that are related to the co-funding. Uh, we have uh, uh, Inger asking, uh, what is the co-funding rate for municipalities? But then there is a broader question, how much is actually this co-funding? And Rene is wondering why our co-funding is lower than in other uh, programs, like for example, Horizon Europe. So <laughs> Petra, if you know, maybe you can enlighten <laughs> our participants. <laughs> Well, I do not enough about the Horizon uh, program, but what I can say is that the regulation says that the maximum um, co-financing rate in an ERDF uh, pro program can be 80%. And that's the pro um, also the maximum rate that we're going to use here. And I think also when you come to an interreg euro project, um, an institution should also have an own interest in participating and it should also be ready to make a certain contribution um, to the um, project. And I think this is also reflected when the partner states, when the parliament together decided on this maximum um, financing rate of 80%. Okay, thank you very much for the answers. Thank you, Petra, again for keeping up with the chat. I can, I can hear that there is a lot going on on that side. And thank you also to the team answering the questions in writing. Um, we will take one more question, Petra, if you have one, and then we have still one more dimension to add to this future Interreg Europe program mix. So we want to add that in the mix and keep covering your questions later. But for now, Petra, one more question to Petra or Nico. I have actually one more question for Petra as we have her here and it's about finances. Uh, Freya is asking, how is the funding amount distributed? meaning between the coordinator, meaning the lead partner and the other partners. And there is a question whether there is a pre-financing. Well, um, let me start with the last question. First of all, um, unfortunately, it's not possible to pre-finance um, projects. It might also be different from other um, um, uh, EU-funded um, programs. Um, however, in, um, we don't have enough pre-financing ourselves to be able to give pre-financing to the projects. Um, so it's, of course, important um, to bear in mind when you join a project, you also have to be able to pre-finance. Um, but then also um, we are relatively quick to make payments. So um, every six months a report is uh, submitted. And if the support uh, the report is of good quality, we also reimburse very um, quickly. We have a well-functioning um, payment system. So I can reassure about it. No pre-financing, but very good um, procedures in place to make the reimbursements as fast as possible, as we know that you depend on having them um, as soon as possible. Um, then I think the second part was about the distribution um, of the um, project budget within the partnership. I mean, this is up, uh, entirely up to the partnership um, to decide on this, what the need is. Of course, there is a particular role of the lead partner. So usually the big bulk of the budget goes to the lead partner organization um, because they have a, um, a higher responsibility that also needs to be reflected in the budget. Managing a project requires also a bit of a higher budget. But um, at the same time, we also find it very important that the budget is, is also balanced in the partnership. Um, of course, if you want to cooperate, um, the expertise is in the end in the partner organizations. So it's also important that the partners have an, um, an, yeah corresponding budget that allows them to fully be part of the partnership and to participate in all the activities. Excellent. Thank you, Petra. And thank you, thank you very much for the answers. And thank you very much for all the questions. It's, it's great to see that you're, you're coming up with, even if it were very detailed questions, it means that you're seriously thinking about new projects, which is exactly what we want to see at this point. That's the whole purpose of this event. Keep sending those questions in. Keep keeping our chat team busy. That's what they're there for. So uh, don't hesitate to use the Q&A tab for your questions. Also the chat for any general comments. Now, like I said, I want to add one more dimension into this mix, one that you have already heard about because we have been talking about it quite a bit during this event. That is our policy learning platform. Indeed, we've taken you through the program, how it's going to work, the projects and our final 
financing. But the policy learning platform, as you've heard, will still continue to be there as well and offers you additional opportunities for cooperation and reaching out to other regions. So let's take a quick look at how that is going to work in the 2021-2027 programming period. We have a short video introduction to begin with and then Magda Anagnosto, who those of you who joined yesterday have already met, will be here to tell you more. So here's the platform. Imagine if you could easily find solutions to make your region or city smarter, greener, better connected, more social, and closer to citizens. The Interreg Europe Policy Learning Platform can help you access knowledge about the latest policy trends, discover expert validated good practices from all over Europe, find solutions in our peer review, get tailored support from our expert team. We can connect you with the right people and organizations. Together, we will find ways to solve your region's or city's challenges. Start your policy learning journey today. Oh, hello everyone. I would like also to give you an insight on how the policy learning platform of the future will look like. Well, let me start by saying that the story of the policy learning platform so far has been quite successful and very, very rich. For those one that have participated and have been following us since yesterday, you found out and you learned that we have thousands of good practices in our database, uh, tested by the regions, validated by our experts for your inspiration. We have also a very large community of uh, practitioners around Europe with whom you can discuss and network. We have organized uh, the last years a lot of uh, thematic events, policy learning events, and a lot of activities of expert support with peer reviews and matchmaking to find solutions to your regional programs, problems. So, uh, it's also important to mention that the feedback that we have been uh, systematically collected from the beneficiaries and also through targeted evaluations has been very positive. So, for us, it's quite reassuring to see what we are doing is really useful for you. I could really say that uh, the reality today of the policy learning platform has met somehow the ambition that we had when we launched this innovative tool back in 2016. Therefore, uh, in the new programme, the Interreg Europe Policy Learning Platform will continue with no interruption and we continue offer to the regional policy makers access to knowledge, access to people and access to expertise for free. But there are some new elements and what is new is that now uh, we are more experienced. Actually, what you heard uh, from Nico and Petra, there is no revolution, there is rather an evolution. Now, uh, however, we are more experienced and we would like to offer you, to go a step further, to offer you even more tailored and personalized services to better uh, match the needs that you have. And we would like also to involve you even more uh, to propose more uh, community engagement activities. So concretely, maybe, just to see uh, on uh, the knowledge aspect, on the knowledge hub, you will continue to have access to a big uh, database of good practices and uh, you will find a variety of different uh, thematic publications. But we would like also to propose uh, uh, that you are commenting, you have the possibility to comment and contribute to the content that we publish. So again, going more closer to you. Uh, indeed, the community will continue. We hope that we'll keep on growing. Uh, and we would uh, continue offering you networking possibilities, organizing events for you, policy learning events. And we like also to allow you even to co-shape the agendas and propose even more uh, activities that you can contribute and get involved. Last but not least, uh, the expert support services will continue. Um, always with the objective to meet better your needs. So you will be able uh, to get uh, written feedback to, to your issues through our policy help desk, which we are also thinking of evolving that into a community help desk where you will be able to interact and help each other in a real community of peers. 
but you will also be able to team up with other selected peers through the structure form of a matchmaking session. This is a short session where we bring you together with other peers and you discuss to find out solutions for your challenges. But even with the longer uh, working sessions of two days of the peer reviews that we organize with you and selected peers again and local involvement of uh, stakeholders uh, to find targeted uh, hands-on practical solutions for your challenges. So the idea again here is to elaborate further these services. Uh, so we are really eager to hear back what is useful for you and uh, we are uh, willing to evolve and make it really adapted and useful uh, on, on your needs. So maybe with these words to say that uh, we have created a little bit of appetite for you uh, to integrate uh, the cooperation and also the continuous learning in your daily work. And if you don't know where to start, I would just simply say come and join the Interreg Europe Policy Learning Platform. Thank you. Thank you, Magda. That was a very good brief overview of how the policy learning platform works and an important reminder because indeed I know you're interested in new calls for project proposals and you're interested in collaboration with other regions but there is more than just a project. We do have the platform that is available to you. You can access it online. You probably met many of the experts already yesterday and by the way in case you missed any of the activities that happened yesterday, any of the thematic sessions, our intro plenaries or any other moments of the event, you can catch up on those via the replay tab. We have the recordings available to you and uh, you can of course reach out to any of us through the platform as well. So make use of these uh, interaction and communication tools, not only to find new partners but also to see how we can help you to meet people from other regions. We are here to do that for you. Um, I want to now continue with our two speakers, Nico and Petra. I know you still have a lot of questions. I know you still want more information and you probably are wondering how to get started with your project development and ideas. So let's turn back to the chat and see with Petra what else our speakers need to cover. Petra, how is it looking? Busy, <laughs> as just a while ago. Uh, we still have plenty of questions on partnerships, on topic activities, because you, Nico, you were explaining about the pilots, the improving of policy instruments, uh, something about the timing, uh, when things will be uh, open. So uh, maybe uh, I can start with the timing, uh, because that was one of the Key, uh, key information that people were interested in uh, when we looked at the word cloud at the very beginning. What do you think, Mia? Yes, yes, we can go into timing. I was going to uh, save that for last because that's a very popular question, but we can indeed address that as well. Um, do you have a specific question to kick us off or should I hand over to Nico and Petra to tell us a bit more? Petra. Maybe, maybe get a, they can present what they prepared for us and then we can go right away to all the questions that we have on the list. All right then, the question that everyone is thinking about. Let's dive right into it. Nico, Petra, what's going to happen? When is there going to be a new call? What is the timeline? When can we start with new projects? Well, at the moment, um, well, since June, the program is approved already by the partner states. The next step is now the submission of the program and getting the approval from the European um, Commission. In order to do this, we still have to fulfill one condition, and that is to have all the signed agreements from all the partner states, because the partner states have to actually sign a paper saying that they didn't only vote in our committee in favor of the program, but they, they really adhere to it. And as some of these agreements even have to be signed by ministers in some countries. It takes a little while, but we are reaching now um, very soon the end of collecting these agreements so that we think we will be able to submit at the very beginning of 2022 the program to the Commission and hope to have then the Commission approval by May 2022. This is the timeline in the background, but I know the main question that is interesting for our participants is the question, when will there be the first call for proposals? When can we actually apply? Um, well, for this, um, we still have a very rough timeline. We put on the screen, um, the f we will open a call in the first semester 2022, and we think it's going to be in spring, something like April. We hope we will be able to open um, the first call for proposals. 
So this kind of comes back to the, the disclaimer that Nico shared at the very beginning. Um, can you maybe elaborate a little bit on this? Because there will be follow-up questions on the timelines. Okay, first call coming in the spring. Uh, what does it mean in terms of when, when the project might be starting and what's kind of the timeline stretching a bit further into the future, if we can go that far? <laughs> Maybe I can start. Can both. Uh, <laughs> uh, complete what I'm going to say well, another important information I think for our audience today that it it should rather be a short call as we did it in the first call of the previous of the current programming period uh, because we have some uh, financial pressure uh, for spending the money and uh, we really need to start as soon as possible. So that the reason why this event is so important and that the reason why we should push the people to start preparing already now. Uh, and if we manage this rather short call, we hope that an approval from the partner states could be reached uh, by autumn, which means that uh, the first call project could start at the earliest end of 2022 or beginning of 2023. I think that's more or less what we can say at this stage. I think it becomes obvious that a lot of things are happening in parallel. There's still the program preparation ongoing in our committees with the partner states. Um, there is still this formal approval by the commission pending. On the other side, we want to be ready the moment we have this approval. We want to go out. We want to start financing the projects. And that's why, while we do in the background still all the formalities, we already want to promote the program and get you ready to be able to apply in the first call for proposals with very good quality projects. Yes, and I think this is an important message and a, an important call to action to all of you today. That indeed is the whole point of this event. We'll give you as much information as we can, but really the time to start preparations for your next project is right now. More details will come, but it will be then easier for you to just do those final tweaks if you already have a good idea and if you're already working on it. And uh, regarding the timeline, um, do have our afternoon session in your calendar as well, because at, at 1.30, uh, from 1.30 to 2, we do have a tip uh, session on uh, tips and tools for project preparation. So we are going to tell you exactly what the steps are to prepare your next project and we'll tell you how we help you do that. So in addition to the general timeline of how the program is prepared, when the call will launch and all that, we also take you through the process step by step. So get ready for that. Now back to the questions and back to the program, the projects, the finances. Now that people have a little overview of what lies ahead of us, um, what are the next questions, Petra, for Miko and Petra here? Well, I would say that uh, this information called yet another set of questions. Uh, for example, uh, we have a question, how many calls we are expecting and whether there will be another one also in 2022? It's a very interesting question because I thought about it when I answered that this may come. Um, I think the, the provisional timing is to have uh, four call and each one uh, uh, one per year, if I can say this. We cannot really afford organizing two calls in the same year uh, for different reasons, but mainly related to the resources. And we also allocate our resources to assistance when a call is open, then to uh, evaluation, assessment, and of course then uh, to monitoring the projects. So there will be more opportunities after uh, 2022, that's for sure. Uh, and I think in total it could be up to between three to four calls, maybe more in case uh, uh, we don't have enough demand, but we are not too worried about uh, this, I have to say. Already based on the interest we're seeing in the new program, in this event, in any updates that we share, I, it definitely shows that there is interest. So I would again not delay preparations of the projects any more than you have to start now and it will put you in a better position also for later. Um, I have another question, not so much to our speakers, but to our participants, because as we move through your questions, now that we've given you the timeline, some information on what is coming and all that, I would be very keen to know only what, not only what you want to know, but what you are going to do. We will put another poll up in Slido to ask about your next steps, both during this event and later on. So give some input to that while we continue with your questions and some answers. Petra, back to you. What else is on the list? Well, as I said, the list is really full. Uh, our um, 
um, colleagues uh, working on the chat uh, are very busy replying. Uh, but when we were talking about this timing, uh, we are getting also a little bit to the procedure of application. There is a question, are our applications a one-phase or a two-phase process? So let's start with the applications. Mm -hmm. I go ahead. Okay. Um, this will be a one-phase uh, process. We know that a uh, lot of other EU programs uh, go in this uh, in these two stages uh, for many reasons that I don't think uh, are so relevant uh, today. Uh, this is very straightforward. This is one phase. Uh, there's a deadline. You have to submit the full application uh, by that deadline and then uh, the assessment starts with two stages, eligibility and quality assessment, to prepare recommendation to the member states who finally decide uh, on applications. Yes, anything to add, Petra? No? Okay. Uh, one more thing maybe to add that, yes, um, there is also pre-steps that you can take and those are the steps that we'll cover in the afternoon session. So you'll hear more about how you can get ready for that, for that actual applications if you join us at 1.30. Um, Petra, next question. Well, the next question is related to the timing of the actual publication of documents for the first call. Do we have uh, some estimation when people can see the documents that will help them prepare their project? Well, I think it won't be possible to make documents available before we will launch um, the first call, so before spring um, next year. Um, we share with you whatever information we have already today. The program document um, that was approved by the partner states in June is already out. It's on our website and the more information we get, the more we will be sharing it. I think the main point to um, turn to is the Interreg Europe website where then all information will progressively be shared and then the full application pack to be shared the moment we're going to open the call. I don't know, Nico, if you have some is, uh, other... If I were a, a, a future applicant, uh, this question is fundamental for me because I heard about new things today and I would like to, say, to see them written, to see exactly what it means. Um, I'm even wondering if there could not be a, a draft with warning of the manual published at the beginning uh, of next year, at least that the version is available. But one advice I could give also to most uh, of the people is already to look at the current program manual because we keep on repeating today that it's a re an evolution, not a revolution, and the spirit remains more or less the same. Uh, there's a clear message to get uh, the policy responsible authorities on board, that's for sure, uh, but uh, all the rest is quite similar to what we have been uh, implementing in 2014-2020. Uh, Indeed. And we have been talking about building on the past, not only in terms of results and, and activities, but also in terms of the programme. So you'll find the current programme documents on our website. When it comes to the future documents, um, there is a section, there's a booth in the Expo here in Hopin dedicated to the 2021-2027 programme. You can have a look at that. It'll lead you directly to the place where you find the information on our website. And this is a page that you might want to bookmark for later because that's the place that we keep up updating with new information about the new program as we, as we advance with the preparations. So another few tips there for you to take note of. Petra, uh, I'm sure we have more questions, so let's hear it. Oh, we do, Mia. Um, well, another question that is still related to timing goes much further because people are asking, OK, if we submit an application, in which time, how long would it take to hear an answer whether our project is approved? Uh, so uh, perhaps I would repeat a bit what, what I said a bit earlier, is that uh, if everything goes well uh, according to what we have in mind, uh, you would submit somewhere in spring of 2022 and uh, you would have an answer of the monitoring committee about the approval or non-approval, hopefully approval, uh, in the second semester and it would be, I think, towards the end of the year. In, at the earliest in autumn, you will get the answer depending on the number of applications we receive. Uh, at the latest, by the end of the year, you would know whether or not uh, your application is approved, so you can start at the latest by the beginning of 2023. I hope this, ans this answers uh, the question. Okay, let's take some more questions. Petra, if you have a few that we can group, we could take them uh, maybe two or three if you have, and we'll discuss them with Petra and Nico. Uh, well, 
At this moment, I was planning to ask more something about the application as we were talking about kind of submitting it, approving it and timing of it. I have a few questions, just very few, about the content. Uh, and uh, Nico, you were talking about some kind of a letter uh, for the partners and Rene is asking that in the previous program there was this support letter proving connection to structural funds. So how it's going to be, can you maybe repeat and clarify how it's going to be with the current program? with the letters and the support uh, documents. Yes, this is important because this, uh, this is part of the eligibility of the application, what we call now the declaration. We have a general wording for this. Uh, I would just specify in the question that it was not only to make the link with structural funds, it was to make the link with the policy responsible authorities. Uh, we may take an example. If you address the sustainable urban mobility plan of the city of Krakow, uh, we would expect to see the city of Krakow as partner directly in the application form. If it's not possible, it's a transport authority, public transport authority or another intermediate organization. This organization, to be eligible in a project, in an intraeur project, would need to obtain a declaration from the city of Krakow, uh, a declaration of participation, let's say, in the project. And this would replace what we currently have uh, as a letter of support, we wanted to make the life easier of the beneficiaries. They had two different documents, what used to be called a partner declaration, which is mainly financially for a normal partner with budget, and a letter of support. We have regrouped everything in one single template called declaration, and there's a, a left column for the normal partner with financial information, and a right column, which is more for the policy, uh, associated policy authority, uh, who commits uh, to, the, to the project. But uh, this declaration remains and replace, in a way, uh, the letter of support. All right, time for the next question, I think, Petra. Yes, and this time I would uh, go back uh, to some of the questions that we didn't manage to cover with Nico previously, which were still about the topics and some partnership issues. Uh, again, plenty of questions came regarding partnership and some clarifications. Uh, Mata's wondering uh, whether with this special um, participation of Norway and Switzerland in our program, was it, whether it has any connection with this associated partner status. Uh, maybe you can clarify, Nico, uh, the role of uh, institutions from Norway and Switzerland in our projects. Norway and Switzerland. <laughs> uh, I see our speakers looking at each other. I don't know which one wants to begin. Maybe even answer it together because I think Please this do. question um, comprised two elements. One element was about the participation of uh, Norwegian and Swiss partners in the um, program. And I think this I can answer. The other element um, in the question is about um, this status of associated policy authorities, and I think that's Nico's speciality. <laughs> if I start with the Swiss and Norwegian um, partners, so um, indeed I think it's a good question because when we had shown the program budget, I hadn't mentioned that there is also a particular budget set aside for Norwegian partners. We wait at the moment still for a confirmation what budget there will be, but it will be possible for partners from Norway to participate in the projects and to get also um, specific Norwegian funding from the program. So we, are, we will be managing both the European funding as well as the Norwegian funding so that it doesn't make any difference for them um, for their participation. Then Swiss partners um, are also um, very welcome to participate. Um, Switzerland is also an active member of the program, part of the um, committees. The only difference is that we are not f um, handling directly the financing. So in order to obtain financing, they would have to turn to the national um, point of contact. And um, um, this person could help them and advise them where they could get the Swiss funding from. It's managed directly within Switzerland, but not going channeled through the program. That's a bit the difference between Norwegian and Swiss partners. But both countries are full part of the program and we are happy to have Swiss and Norwegian um, partners on board and look forward to seeing plenty of them. 
Definitely. Nico, you wanted to add something. Uh, yeah, I, I think Petra has already answered to, to the question that this associated uh, status authority has nothing to do with Norway and Switzerland. Norway and Switzerland are normal partners, are normal uh, uh, partner states in this program. Uh, and you can have an associated policy authority in Norway, in Switzerland, in France, in Germany, in uh, Croatia. This is more project per project where we see uh, the application form, we see the policy instrument addressed and we see whether or not uh, the policy responsible authority are partners or not. When they are not directly involved as partners, they need to come as associated authority. All right. Um, that is very, very good to see that your questions are coming and I'm so glad you're keeping the chat team busy because that's what they're there for. Um, before we take any more questions, we will, don't worry, uh, we had this Slido poll open to get a little bit of info on your next steps and ideas that you're planning. Let's have a quick look at that. Petra, do you maybe have a comment on the, on the poll? Well, of course I do. Uh, the poll again is quite busy. Thank you very much to all of you for contributing. And we can see that the most favorite uh, option, the next step that you want to take is to check out ideas from others. So we hope uh, that you will find some inspiration, maybe some potential for cooperation, and maybe some of these will turn into project proposals in the first call. So that's the first um, clear, clear front runner with 58%. And then uh, something very similar, uh, you plan to go to the expo to check some of the inspiration, 35%. Um, some of you want to give a try to the networking, talking with each other uh, on one-to-one -one basis. Uh, others still wait for more information. We are here for that. We will pass this information to you very gladly. Yeah, and then um, some people plan to maybe use the policy learning platform. We are also very glad to hear, and, and I'm sure that Magda hears it very, very gladly that the platform also is very interesting. So that's, yeah, that's the poll. Thank you for contributing. All right. Excellent sounding results. I'm very happy to see that. We will continue with questions, additional questions and answers with Nico and Petra in just a moment, but we are coming to the official end of this morning session. I promised you that we would keep the program going until 12 and then continue with questions afterwards. If needed, I see that there is a need, so we will. So now just a couple of quick steps on what happens next in case you won't be joining us for an extra Q&A while we stay here for a little while after this session closes. There is indeed a whole afternoon for you to make use of. This has been the info that we wanted to share with you. The new program is coming, the new call for proposals is coming. You can already start sharing your project ideas and we're so happy to see that many of you have done that already. From 12.30 onwards, there's nothing but project idea discussions, networking sessions, project pitches happening throughout the afternoon until four. So pick the sessions that interest you, have a look at those project ideas and start getting ready because the call is coming. We will also be available throughout the entire afternoon. You'll find us in the expo at the Interreg Europe booth. There is a point of contact corner as well where the national representatives are available to answer your questions as well. So go and check that out. Uh, look at all of the resources available in the expo. You have all that inspiration, solutions and ideas that you can build on over there. And we have one more session for you in the afternoon at 1.30. From 1.30 to 2, we are going to take you through step by step how you prepare your next project. So tools and support for project development is coming up. This is it for the morning session, but feel free to stay with us. We will take a little breath, fill our glasses of water and get ready to answer more of your questions right after this. Thank you so much for joining. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon or stay with us for the Q&A and we'll be with you soon. Mm -hmm.